morning. Welcome to the East Presbyterian Church. It's my pleasure to preach you. It's going to be a soggy, soggy morning. Um, umbrellas are invented. I don't know when. They certainly help in this kind of situation. Uh, we're glad uh, that you're here. Our worship folder was made available to you. We're in the sanctuary. If you didn't get one, raise your hand and uh, someone will bring one to you. We have friendship folders on the inside of each of our pews. If you please take these and fill out the information and pass it down the pew. It's helpful to us to know of your time uh, with us. If you're here for the first time, we we'll give you an extra special <coughs> welcome and thank you for choosing uh, to worship the Lord uh, with us. Uh, just one major announcement you'll see on the back page of the worship folder that on the 14th of January, the elders, we are announcing that there will be a congregational meeting right after the worship service for the purpose of electing uh, Mickey Otto to the office of the deacon. Uh, he was nominated from the congregation. He's been through uh, the process, quote unquote, been examined and approved by the elders. And so we're going to have that election right after the service on the morning of January the 14th. And just one reminder in relationship to the raininess this morning. You do know the new building includes a covered drive through So, <laughs> a blessing of that little detail on a rainy morning. Well, you don't get many rainy Sunday mornings, but on a late day like today, it will be a blessing to have that covered drive through Well, we're in the Advent season here worshiping the Lord, celebrating the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let us look to the Lord during this prelude as uh, the candle of love will be lit on our Advent uh, wreath this morning. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For He has been mindful of the humble state of His servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped His servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as He said to our fathers. Let us pray. Father, as we are in Your presence worshiping on this Lord's Day, yes, we can in our minds think back to 2,000 years ago, we see how excited Mary was as she said in her soul she glorifies 
you, her Lord and her God, because of what she had been informed of. The birth of the Messiah, the Son of God, the incarnate one who would come into this world to save all of your people from their sin. And Father, we are here this morning as those who have surely and truly benefited from the incarnation of Jesus Christ. For He is our Lord and Savior. And so, Father, fill us with Your Holy Spirit. Fill us with praise and joy as we worship You this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing and turning your hymnals to number 226. We'll begin by singing, As with Gladness Nineveh, and then we'll turn to page 200 and sing, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. Thank you. 
to continue our time of worship before the Lord. We are called the Lord to be a humble people. And you know, I don't know of any more appropriate way to act in humility toward the Lord than it is with our sin. And what I mean is repenting of it, confessing it, turning from it, and seeking God's forgiveness as we worship. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to all have the opportunity silently in prayer to turn from our sins in the presence of God. Let us pray. Father, we have just been singing as we come in Jesus' name. We've just been singing of the great joy that surrounds the Advent season, the songs that remind us of the glory of what took place in the little town of Bethlehem so many hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And Father, we are so thankful that that incarnation took place so that Jesus Christ would grow up in wisdom and stature and in favor with both God and men and one day be for us the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He did not just come to do good things. He did not come just to teach truth. He ultimately came to die in our place. We thank You for that. And as those who have believed in Your Gospel, Lord, we admit, we confess openly that we still struggle with our sin. Thoughts we think, words we say, <coughs> actions that we demonstrate oftentimes are sinful. And so in all humility, Lord, we turn to You now in the quiet of each of our hearts. We confess and we repent. Lord, as we have turned to You in faith, believing that when we confess and repent of our sins, we are not just jumping through some religious hoop, that we are literally laying our sinful ways at the foot of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and knowing that You are a forgiving and merciful God. Thank You, Father, for forgiving us of our sins. We pray in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Our assurance of pardon that you'll find in the verse of folder this morning is drawn from Psalm 86. I think the psalmist articulates very well what it is that we pray when we confess our sins and repent. Let us be reminded of what we're taught in Psalm 86. Join with me. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to You. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I am in distress, I call to You, because You answer me. Among the gods, there is none like You, Lord. No deeds can compare with Yours. No truer statement has ever been spoken than that right there. No gods can bear to our God. He is a forgiving God. We'll confess our faith now. You'll notice the Nicene Creed. We used it last week. We're going to use it this Lord's Day morning. And next Lord's Day morning, it is a more expansive uh, theological statement, uh, even than the Apostles' <coughs> Creed, which gives us a full orb understanding of what we are believing when we say we believe in our triune God. Especially, you'll notice... Uh, the additional statements made concerning Jesus Christ. So let us uh, in unison uh, confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. 
and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day He rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And He shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. That's what we are instructed to believe. Yes, we do believe. Join with me as I lead us in corporate prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, come again into Thy glorious, glorious place where You dwell. We come not on our own merit, but we come by way of the merit of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so it is in His name we offer up these prayers to You. For we have just confessed the truth about Jesus. That He is the only begotten Son of God, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. Of equal substance with You, O Father. And You have given Him to us. Into this world He came. Born under the law of Moses. Into the sinful troubles of this dark and fallen world in which but oh, how we know, Lord, He came with a mission. A mission to deal with our sin. To be raised from the dead and ascended again back to Your right hand. And Father, we are joyful this Advent season to be able to confess these truths and know these things are real and to glory and revel in the Savior that You have given to us. Father, we know that Jesus gave many, many teachings while He was here. One of His teachings seemed to be focusing on His kingdom. Always seeming to tell parables about His kingdom. Giving instructions about His kingdom. What we might expect concerning His kingdom. Who would be a part of His kingdom. And what we are to do, those who are a part of the kingdom. That is, to take the gospel and spread it across the face of the earth. So Father, this morning, in our prayers, we think of missionaries who have left America, obedient to your call upon their heart and upon their life, who have gone to places that are strange, strange to them, surely to any of us here today. If we were to go to those places, they would be strange to us. We pray for the Kreider family, Derek and Catalina this morning, who minister in Romania. We pray, Father, that they would be mightily used of you as beacons of light, place where the lost humanity there in Romania could find Jesus Christ through what they're doing, preaching the gospel, meeting the needs of those who have physical deficiencies, and still ministering to refugees that are coming across the border from Ukraine. Lord, bless the Kreider family. We are thankful to be supporting of them and helping them in their mission work in Romania. Father, for our congregation here at Redeemer, I thank you so much for what we were able to do last Sunday evening. A number of us went over to Langdale Place to the assisted living facility and were able to bless those residents by singing the Christmas carols. It was obvious that they enjoyed what we did and Lord, I would dare to say it was as much of a blessing for us who went as it was for them. It is so good to share the glory and the joy of Jesus Christ and His birth. Father, uh, we lift, look to You as always for the financial needs of, of this Your church here at Redeemer. And Lord, I would pray that, that You might move in the hearts of all of us this Advent season, that we might generously and with great bounty bring tithes and offerings into your Lord's church that, that our church might have all that it needs to press forward with what you are doing among us. And we pray as well, Lord, that, that you would bless us during this Advent celebration.
that you would keep our hearts in tune with the real reason for the season. Give us the grace, O oh Lord, to rise above what our culture seems to focus on so much, materialism and so forth and so forth. O oh Lord, give us humble and contrite hearts, knowing that this is truly all about the birth of Jesus Christ. And Father, we think of those who are not well. I certainly rejoice that Madeline Clay Schultz is with us this morning, that you have sought to bring relief to her back pain and, and have absolutely done so. She just told me a few minutes ago, Father, praise be to you for your graciousness and kindness towards Madeline. We pray for Shelby Ruiz. We know that uh, she is waiting to see the disposition of her situation with this biopsy that was taken. And, Lord, we just pray her into your holy hands and we're all just trusting you, Lord, and looking to you on her behalf. Father, we pray for those who are in the throes of grief. We know our brother Bill Gandy lost his mother about a week ago and we continue to lift up the Gandy family as they uh, walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But Lord, you tell us in the 23rd Psalm uh, that you are there with your rod and your staff to console all who are in such a place and we pray that that would be true for the Gandhi family and finally Father we close our time of prayer uh, this morning I, I think of all of us here that will have family visiting or perhaps going to visit family in this next week week or two uh, Lord help us help us to, to minister to our families uh, all of us probably have family members who are not believers Lord, grace us with the words to say. Help us to be kind and humble and gentle as we celebrate with our family the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we bring all these prayers into your holy presence in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Old Testament reading, which corresponds with 1 John, where I'm going to be preaching on love this morning, uh, is in Jeremiah 31. Now, Jeremiah 31 is a is a very uh, consequential chapter. A couple, three chapters, 31, 32, 33. Jeremiah is uh, speaking way into the forward times about the coming of the Messiah, the new covenant, and it really is all couched in God doing this because of His love. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. I will build you up again and you will be built, O virgin Israel, again. You will take up your tambourines and go out to dance with the joyful. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. There will be a day when the watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim, Come, let us go up to Zion to the Lord our God. This is what the Lord says. Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, expected mothers and women in labor. A great throng will return. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. And I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble, because I am Israel's father, and Ephraim is my firstborn son. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Proclaim it in distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. And the Lord will ransom Jacob and redeem those from the hand of those stronger than they. Let us now give to the Lord tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Father, we are thankful for all of the ways that you bless us with earthly, we would say, resources, money that we need, and, and other things so that we can press on in this life. And now, Father, we turn to you out of the bounty of which you have given to us, and we bring tithes and offerings into your house. I ask simply that you bless all that comes in this morning. We pray in Jesus' name.
showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Thus ends the reading of this portion of God's holy and inerrant Word. What kind of gifts are you expecting and hoping to receive? Oh, just about a week or so from now. What are you hoping to have someone gift you with? Let me ask the opposite of that question. What are some of the gifts that uh, we are planning to give to others? It's more blessed to what? Give and receive. So uh, there is this give and take when it comes to gifts. Well, I want to talk to you about a gift that keeps on giving. Now, we can give to one another what we would describe perhaps as a gift that keeps on giving. Give someone a membership to a fitness club for the next year, and they're going to have that for the next year. Give someone a puppy dog. <laughs> That's going to keep on giving. Give someone season tickets to their favorite sport. That'll keep on giving. And we give those kinds of gifts sometimes because they constantly <laughs> remind the person that's received the gift of the love of the one that gave the gift. So as often as you hold the puppy dog or go and exercise at the gym, you're reminded, oh, I got this as a gift. And I do appreciate the one who loved me so much to give me that gift. Well, you see, Advent, the Advent of Christ, is God's gift of love that keeps on giving better than a puppy dog, better than season tickets, 
better than a membership at the fitness club. It keeps on, keeps on, keeps on giving. For I would say, love is the enduring message of Advent. Love. And the message of God's love is synonymous with the birth, life, and death of Jesus Christ. That's precisely what the Apostle John is saying there in 1 John chapter 4. That we would equate love that comes from God, as he even says God is love, that the best way we can understand that love is that He gave us His Son. He gave us His Son. Now just a few words about the Apostle John. He has been labeled as the love apostle. And he's given that label really because he wrote so often in his first letter especially about love. He tells us in this letter of 1 John about God's love for us. He exhorts us to have great love in turn for God. He tells us over and over again that we are to love other people. Well, this morning we have before us what I call John's treatise extraordinaire on love. I think he, I think he sums it all up, this love apostle John in all that he has been saying about the topic of love. For John tells us most of what we need to know about love. Agape love is what is being used. This word in this passage is a Greek word which can best be understood as sacrificial love. Sacrificial love. And so we're going to talk about the origin of this true love, this agape love. Where, where did it ever have its beginning? Where did it come from? We're going to talk about the proof of true love. How can we know that God really is love? Is there something that He has done to prove Himself? And then thirdly, we're going to look at the commandment of true love because John turns it right back to us and says, listen folks, if God has so loved us, we ought to love one another. So this Advent season, thus far, we have spoken about hope and and we've spoken about joy. But really the enduring message of Advent is God's love for you and me. It really is. It's God's love for you and me. So let's begin understanding what the Apostle John says to us about the enduring love of God. And where he says it all starts. It all begins with the origin of true love. I want to read verse 7 and 8 again. John says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. So John answers the question quite succinctly, if we would speculate. Where did this true love ever have its beginning? Well, John has two emphatic statements that he makes about the origin of true love. And the first statement that John makes to answer any question we might have about where in the world did true love ever come from is this statement, that it has its exclusive origin in the person of God. In four words, John says, love comes from God. Now in our world there are many sources of love. Conditional love and selfish love and erotic love and, and shallow love. All kinds of demonstrations and exhibitions of love on an earthly plane. But my friend, God is the only source of true love. The only source of true love. You know we have a U.S. patent system here in our country and I believe there is still a seven year window on exclusivity. If you invent something or develop something, you get a patent. No one can do anything with it for seven years. But at the end of seven years, they can do something with it. Well, God is not under a patent restriction. God has been and always will be the exclusive origin of true love. It begins with Him. And the second statement that John makes about the origin of true love is simply this. That divine love is the very nature of God. He uses, again, not many words, just three words. God 
is love. I mean, the Bible tells us so much about God. It tells us God is spirit. God is light. But John tells us here that love is the very nature of God. Might we understand it in this way, that everything God decrees, everything God ever has done, everything He is doing, everything He ever will do, is in keeping with true, unconditional love. For John says, know this, that love comes from God, for God Himself is love. 1 Corinthians 13, I think, has a wonderful description of love. Paul said to the church at Corinth, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So might I ask, are we sure about the origin of true love? Are we sure this Advent season? Concretely, substantially sure about the origin of true love? We must end any confusion that any of us might have this morning. Santa Claus is not true love. I don't want to disappoint anybody. But Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is not true love. Frosty the Snowman is not true love. God, my friend, He is true love. The only place we will find true love is in the person of God. I read in the commentary years ago about the Nile River. People for a long, long time, as you'll see as I read this, wondered where is the headwater of the great Nile River in Africa? Well, for almost 4,000 years, Egyptians and others from around the world wondered about the origin and source of this thousand of miles long river, the Nile. The Egyptians knew it was the sustainer of life for them, and many speculated where its waters came from. But listen, it was not until 1888 that the explorer, Henry Stanley, discovered that the source of the Nile River was deep in the heart of Africa, at the base of the mountain that he called Rainmaker. The commentator went on to say this, that many in our society are seeking for peace, hope, confidence, security, and for love. Where can anyone find true and unconditional love in a world torn by evil and greed? Must a man search 4,000 years to find such love? This love has its source in God. So might I say is, Consequential as it was when Stanley in 1888 discovered the headwaters of the Nile. I'm sure that was on the front page of most all the newspapers in the world. Let us say we definitely know where the headwater of love is. It is, it is in God, our Heavenly Father. End of debate. End of speculation. End of confusion. God is love. Now that is a monumental truth that John delivers to God's people. But John goes on to tell us how God proves He is love. For the Scriptures really are a record of this. The Scriptures from Genesis to Revelation are a record of God saying what He's going to do. Promising what He's going to do. And then doing exactly what he said he would do. So, we have the proof of true love. God didn't just speak with pious platitudes about, oh, I am the God of love, I am love, and so on and so on. But in verses 9 and 10, the Apostle John shows us the proof of God's true love. John tells us that God has proven His love and at least these three ways that John points out. Here's the first proof. It's pretty straightforward. The incarnation of Jesus Christ. What does the first part of verse 9 say? This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His only Son into 
the world. His one and only Son. From where did Jesus come? Well, John says, He came from the glory of the Father. Where for all eternity past and as far back as our little minds can think into the past. Jesus had only ever known the glory of being in perfect union and perfectly in the presence of His Father. But he, but he came from that place into what kind of world did Jesus have the pleasure of entering? Not the Garden of Eden. No, into a fallen world. Into a wicked world into a world which was inhabited with the fallen sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And what kind of humiliation did Jesus undergo? Well, He took on human flesh and He, he dived right into the world of humanity. He was a real man. If you stabbed Him with a knife in the arm, He would bleed. He experienced pain. He needed sleep. He needed physical sustenance. Uh, this is what we understand as a good part of the humiliation of Jesus Christ undergoing the fact that He comes from the glory of the Father. Now to have this sinless earth suit on as the incarnate God-man. What kind of life was Jesus to live? having come into this fallen and wicked world in human flesh. Well, He was born while the Old Covenant was still very much in effect, born under the law of Moses, so it was incumbent upon Jesus Christ that He lived perfectly in obedience to the law of Moses. Our shorter catechism, question and answer 27, help us here. The question is asked, how was Christ humiliated? The answer is Christ was humiliated by being born as a man, born into a poor family, by being made subject to the law and suffering the miseries of this life. Might I say only a God who is love would send His Son into this world. I mean, seriously, think about it. Pause, let's pause and think about it. God knew exactly where He was sending His Son. To this place that we are what? So familiar with. So that's the first proof. That God is truly a God of love. The incarnation of His Son, Jesus Christ, into this world. John tells us the second proof has to do with the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I want to read verse 10. Verse 10, John says, This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is love, John says. Let's not have any false concepts that we really know anything about the kind of love that God loves with. He says definitively, this is love. God sends His Son only to know that He will make sure He dies as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The incarnation would have been incomplete love if God would have stopped short of the cross. Yes, it would. God could not love us by His divine will into a place of salvation short of what? Crucifying His Son. He had to do that. And that's what John is saying is such a profound demonstration of the love of God. What exactly did God's love compel Him to do with His incarnate Son? John says, make atonement for our sins. Propitiation. Pay the penalty. Appease the wrath that God had against us because of our sin. To make way for what the Apostle Paul heralds forth as reconciliation. Though we were enemies with God, we have now become the adopted sons and daughters of God. And we are now His true sons and daughters. In Isaiah 53, it is said that it was the Lord's will to crush Him. That's speaking of Christ. It was the Lord's will to crush Him and cause Him to suffer. It was the Lord's will. Not some second plan. Not some afterthought. I better figure out a way to use my incarnate Son under the salvation of my people. No, it was His express will. 
theologians call this the covenant of redemption. The covenant of redemption. A covenant that was entered into within the confines of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, long before the creation of the world, where there was some type of covenantal binding agreement amongst our triune God. The Father would send the Son. The Son would submit to the Father and go into the world as the incarnate, only begotten Son of God and do the work, live the life, die the death, be raised from the dead. And then the Spirit would be sent forth from the ascended Son and Father into the world to bring in the great harvest of souls. God is love. That's His plan. He executed it, my friend, as John explains, by sending His Son into the world. Could any of us ever seriously doubt our God's love? who would sacrifice his own son. His own son. Not somebody else's son. His own son. And then John, if that was not enough, he gives us a third proof of God's love. The life-giving power of Jesus Christ. Jesus came and died for our atonement. For what reason? Well, John tells us right there in verse 9 that we might live through Him. We who were dead in our transgressions and sins might have what happened to us? Might be raised from spiritual death to spiritual life. Regenerated by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, God's love for us is so exhaustive that it stops nothing short of changing our lives. Changing our life. Those whom God draws to Himself and saves he changes. He changes us. We are spiritually alive in Christ because of the proven love of God. That's the only reason. All we need to do to find the answer to the question, God, why am I saved? Why am I a Christian? Why do I believe in the gospel? Why am I full of your spirit? Why, God? Why, God? He would say, my son, what I did for you through my son, this is my love for you. John says this is love not that we love God, but that he loved us. I think you would agree with me wholeheartedly, would you not, that God has proven his love. He's proven it. He need not do another thing to prove it. He has proven it. I read for you a portion from a book entitled written in blood by Robert Coleman. Where Robert Coleman tells the story of a little boy whose sister needed a blood transfusion. The doctor had explained that she had the same disease the boy had recovered from two years earlier. Her only chance for recovery was a transfusion from someone who had previously conquered the disease. Since the two children had the same rare blood type, the boy was the ideal donor. Would you give your blood to Mary, the doctor asked. Johnny hesitated. His lower lip started to tremble. Then he smiled and said, Sure, I'll give my blood for my sister. Soon the two children were wheeled into the hospital room. Mary, pale and thin. Johnny, robust and healthy. Neither spoke, but when their eyes met, Johnny grinned. As the nurse inserted the needle into his arm, Johnny's smile faded. He watched the blood flow through the tube. With the ordeal almost over, his voice slightly shaky broke the silence. He said, Doctor, when do I die? Only then did the doctor realize why Johnny had hesitated, why his lip had trembled when he agreed to donate his blood. He thought giving his blood to his sister meant giving up his life. In that brief moment, he made his great decision. Johnny, fortunately, didn't have to die to save his sister. Each of us, however, has a condition more serious than Mary's, and it required Jesus to give not just his blood, but to give his life. So John says proof positive that God is love is He gave us His Son only to know that He would have to see to it that He killed His Son. Now John does something very good for us having trafficked in those truths right there when He speaks to us 
about the commandment of truth. Being so loved by God. What are we to do in response? Verses 11 and 12. Tell us about the commandment of true love. John makes it patently clear what kind of people we are to be. Patently clear what kind of people we are to be. First, we need to know this, that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, who have the life of Christ, we have the capacity to truly love. We do. We have been loved by God. We know God, John says over and over, we know God. John confirms that we are born of God. So when all of the masses of humanity, Christians alone, have the capacity, listen, to love like God loves. We have the capacity. Now I'm not saying in its fullest, most exhaustive way we can love like God. That would be a stupid thing for me to say. But we have the capacity. Oh, yes, we do. So think about the example then, if we have this capacity, what is the example then we are to follow? Well, let me read verse 11. John always says, Dear, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now that's real simple. <laughs> it's real simple. Lord, if we in the church could get that into our hearts and minds and be gripped by that truth. That we have been loved and so we ought to follow the example of God who has so loved us and love other people. God planned to love us. He planned to love us. From all eternity past, God planned to love us. Might I ask, are we making plans to love others? Making a plan. I'm going to find a way to love them. God considered the cost when He loved. The example we're following is God, and He certainly considered the cost when He loved. The cost of His only begotten Son when He loved. Are we willing to love even though we know it might cost us something? God was willing to sacrifice. Are we willing to sacrifice in our pursuit of loving others like God has loved us? God loves us completely. Do we follow through to the end? If we say we are going to make a plan to try to love someone because we know we ought to love that person, even if it causes us to have to sacrifice, are we actually going to do what we plan to do? God surely did, and He is our example. So when you think of Jesus born in that stable 2,000 years ago, we know the example to follow. We know the example. And what real difference will this obedience to love like God loves do? What kind of testimony will it have? I don't know if you paid close attention when I read verse 12 the first time, but please pay close attention now. No one in verse 12 has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. Is John really saying that if we love others like God loves us, then people will see God in us? Is that what he is actually saying? Yes, he is actually saying that. So in all of our striving to show this world who God is, John boils it down to this. Love others like you've been loved by God and people will see, they will see that there's something different about us. Something about this agape love that we are practicing. We are to obey the commandment of true love. Remember Jesus said, the world will know you are my disciples by what? Your love one for another. Your love one for another. So the enduring message of Advent is exactly what the Apostle John says it is. God is love. And that will never change. The proof? Look no further than Jesus. The testimony, if someone is speculating about whether or not God is love, 
is for us who have been loved by God to love other people and testify in that way. Testify in that way. I remember years ago, our second oldest son, Fielding, uh, was asking us, asking us, asking us, ramping up to Christmas time for a membership at the local YMCA. And so we gave him a membership at the local YMCA, and I was very sure that just about every time he went to the YMCA, he had to have some kind of thought, hey, I, I think my parents really do love me. And they, they gave me this membership, and I'm here enjoying it. <laughs> now listen, whatever the circumstances are throughout the year, God does love us. Whatever the circumstances we've had in the year 2023, we're going headlong into the year 2024, we can definitely know this bedrock reality, can't we? That God loves us. God sent His only Son to prove that He loves us. We can never forget that and ought we to be motivated to love one another. My favorite Advent hymn is Joy to the World. I'm going to read my favorite stanza from Joy to the World. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and the wonders of His Father, we truly are set back in our heart and soul by the gravity of what your servant John teaches in 1 John 4. Very straightforward, plain spoken, you are love, God. The enduring message, the gift of your Son, is that that is how you have loved us, through Jesus Christ. And we ought to love others, even as we have so been loved. Father, perhaps there's an individual, one or more, I don't know, in our congregation this morning that has never come to know your love. Never believed in Jesus Christ, the atoning sacrifice for their sins. Father, I pray their heart has been struck this morning. I pray you have arrested them in their spirit this morning through your spirit. And that you may bless them with saving faith that they would believe upon Jesus Christ, the one you sent into this world to save sinners from their sin, and that they would join in knowing the enduring message of Advent really is all about Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen. Please stand and turn to page 223 in the hymnals. We'll close out our worship by singing, While Shepherds Watch Their Flocks.